The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. This COVID-19 crisis just keeps mounting with outbreaks cropping up all over the place. Tonight, we'll zero in on spread in the workplace and what Ontario's largest city is trying to do about it. Then we'll hear from the federal minister responsible for Canada's new climate change plan on why they're raising the price and carbon substantially in the coming decade. And from our Ontario hubs, a glimpse at some remarkable pandemic masks as only beadwork artists can make them. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, it's Friday, January 8th, and that's ahead on the agenda. Ontario this week recorded record levels of infection and death from COVID-19. That after Toronto Public Health said it would start publishing the names of employers where significant outbreaks were happening. Will that help? And what else should be done to get workplace spread under control? With us to consider that in Hamilton, Ontario, Dr. Martha Fulford, Associate Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at McMaster University. And in the downtown core of the provincial capital, Victoria Arendale, assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And Happy New Year. Um, before we start our conversation, I wanted to show a clip of Dr. Eileen de Villa uh, from earlier this week, uh, who is the Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto. And here she is explaining the new measures the city is taking amid a surge of new infections. Sheldon, please roll. Today, the COVID-19 dashboard will include new information to further illustrate the characteristics of the virus in Toronto. The website will provide more specificity about workplace-related outbreaks across 11 categories, including workplace settings like grocery stores, pharmacies, food processing sites, offices, warehousing, shipping and distribution, construction, and manufacturing facilities. Additionally, Toronto Public Health is implementing a system to share specific information about workplace outbreaks without compromising individual privacy. Um, I want to get your reactions from the announcement. Uh, Dr. Fulford, I'll ask you first. Um, can I get your reaction to the City of Toronto's decision to begin reporting workplace outbreaks? I think uh, it's important to understand exactly why, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's not for a naming and shaming and blaming, uh, and I, I don't think that's the intent. But if it helps us understand exactly where transmission is occurring, that is helpful. Right now, we've, of course, had a very broad brush approach of shutting down all businesses. And it may be, for example, that small retail is not a risk. It may be that restaurants are not a risk. And uh, understanding in more detail where we are seeing transmission would be helpful in terms of targeting interventions and not to be punitive, but to try to understand why. Is it that there are no appropriate break rooms? Uh, is it happening uh, because of face-to-face -face encounters? Is it deliberate or is it accidental? So I think if, if we can understand and intervene in a way that actually helps businesses carry on, that's very useful. I would just sincerely hope that it's not going to be used to name and shame, which I, I think we all know has been happening in, in certain areas. And Victoria, what is your reaction? Well, I think it's an improvement. I think uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, many people have been asking for more information about uh, workplaces and workers and where we're seeing increased risk. So I do think it's an important development. I think the piece uh, that maybe wasn't touched upon on the clip is this new requirement to have workplaces sort of self-report to Toronto Public Health if they have two or more cases within 14 days. And I think that's... Uh, going to be quite helpful. I mean, obviously, it relies on the employers uh, to make that phone call or send that email. Uh, but I do think, um, as Dr. Fulford mentioned, that if it is going to help us better understand where transmission is occurring, uh, it is going to be a positive. Can you, uh, Victoria, can you give us um, a definition of what an outbreak is? Well, the definition of outbreak seems to differ depend on who's using it. In this case, um, 
the, the trigger point is those two cases within 14 days. And at that point, uh, under the under the announcement that was made, the employer would then have to notify Toronto Public Health. Uh, the naming of the employers or the workplaces happens under a different framework, at least as per my understanding of the announcement, that that would only be done in very select cases where yeah. um, I believe Dr. Davila, as, as she said, um, it's when there was be a large proportion of the workforce affected, a long duration of an outbreak, uh, or where they did feel there's a public health risk associated with the outbreak. So there's, in my mind, there is two pieces to this shift that's happening in the way workplace data is is being collected. Uh, and, and I agree, I don't, um, I don't think the naming and shaming is particularly useful, but I do think um, that having more information in the system about workplaces is valuable. You said that the, there's two pieces to this. Uh, what are the two pieces? So that, that first piece is around if there are two cases within 14 days now, Toronto Public Health is requiring employers to report, to disclose to Toronto Public Health. So previously they didn't have to do that. Uh, and then the piece that uh, seems to be getting a lot of attention is this, this concern or this new approach in the dashboard to actually name businesses uh, where there are these larger outbreaks. Um, and all of this, of course, requires on individuals, um, you know, coming forward and saying that they uh, have COVID or even in the first place to get tests. And I understand that you both don't work for Toronto Public Health, but I wanted to um, address sick days because I think when in Ontario, most people have um, three days for sick days. And with COVID, it's a whole new ball game, um, even just to get your results. Sometimes it can take uh, between two to four days. Um, do you think that that component, um, it's one thing to uh, for workplaces to report the numbers, but maybe there's another piece uh, about sick days that we should be also talking about. Dr. Fulford, in your opinion. Well, that's actually very important because people do need to work. They need to feed, feed their families. They need to pay their rent. And if we aren't actually providing a safety net for people, it's a very difficult situation. And of course, there are some jobs or uh, businesses where they're not going to be able to shut down. And so again, if if doing this allows for a, a much better analysis of why there are breaches going on, but it does depend on an honor system. And if somebody is asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic and it's their livelihood at stake, and we are not providing any sort of a safety cushion for them, any kind of support, you can understand why they're not might not be the strongest incentive to, to put yourself forward to be tested. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we are hoping that people will be. We, we desperately want transmission to come down. But there is a very important human factor here. People need to, to survive. And without that safety net, uh, we're not doing everything we can. And Victoria, the mayor, uh, John Tory, has um, encouraged people to do the right thing. But I, I think people do want to do the right thing. But if you do find yourself in a situation where you could potentially lose income because you are sick, um, are sick days um, a, a part uh, important to include in this conversation? Yeah, I think they're a really important part of the the larger social discussion. I mean, the the yeah. sick work, sick paid work leave, or pardon me, paid sick leave. Uh, really does need to be in place if we want people to stay home when they're sick, which is really one of the yeah. pillars of the public health recommendations. And, you know, I would note that that's not within the, 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 the scope or the ability of Toronto Public Health mm -hmm. to implement. They do need other levels of government uh, to, to act on that particular aspect. I know in uh, the conversations that I have, we do encourage workplaces to perhaps communicate more more than they would uh, in other settings about the supports that are available. There are federal level programs that might be applicable, but they don't cover everybody. And, and so I do think that this, this policy discussion around paid sick leave is really, is really critical to society uh, uh, getting through this. Amazon was one of the places that um, was reported to have outbreaks in the hundreds. And uh, they've said that they would give their employee, uh, employees up to two weeks leave. Uh, Dr. Fulford, when, you know, we've been hearing about outbreaks in long-term care facilities. How bad is the problem in workplaces like factories, warehouses, and grocery stores? 
Well, that, of course, is one of the reasons why knowing where the transmission is occurring is going to help us. Uh, there have been some uh, severe outbreaks in certain settings, like some of the meatpacking plants earlier on, some of the warehouses. But again, some of this information hasn't been uh, as transparent as we would like. And so that's where understanding where transmission is happening is very helpful. But part of that is also going to be understanding why it's happening. What are the barriers to to uh, good infection control in a workplace? And for example, is physical distancing impossible? Are the break rooms inadequate? Do the staff have enough time to actually take mask breaks? I think we all know it's extremely difficult to have a mask on your face all the time. And we need to provide safe spaces where somebody can sit with appropriate physical distancing and have a mask off have their coffee, have their food. In mean, hospitals, we have excellent infection control in our hospitals and where we have had breaches have always been in, in situations like break rooms. And so knowing where the outbreaks are occurring is, is I think a huge step forward. Also because it might help justify or not justify, but allow smaller businesses to, to reopen. It might allow a much more uh, considered and appropriate reopening of, of, of the economy when we no longer need any sort of a lockdown. But I, I do think that part of this, I, I hope, will will go along with an educational component for the workplaces and, and a really a good look at why it's happening. There's another thing we need to discuss uh, uh, along with uh, sick leave is actually uh, quarantine space. Mm. Because some people live in multi-generational homes, they live in crowded settings, and we haven't actually given or, or thought about where can people go if they can't isolate. So there are a lot of social factors that, yes, aren't part of, of uh, public health, but it is a, a societal conversation. If we're asking people to do these things, we need to actually give them a, a way to do it. Um, I believe the city of Toronto has um, hotels now where people can yeah. quarantine, but I don't know if people, if that's like um, everybody knows that. Um, no, I don't think. Yeah. And, and yesterday, Dr. Williams announced that schools are going to remain closed in southern Ontario, Ontario for another two weeks. When we talk about workplace safety, Dr. Fulford, uh, should we also be talking about outbreaks in schools? Well, actually, schools have not been a big source of outbreaks. Uh, and again, we have to be very careful how we define outbreak. But if you look at, at the total, the numerator, the number of, of children and teachers that have become sick com uh, compared to the denominator, the total numbers, schools have not actually been a significant source of transmission. And this is something that has not been very well uh, explained, I think, I think to, to the general public. But also any discussion of an outbreak or a closure has to go with the harm associated with it. Mm -hmm. we, we obviously want to control the transmission of COVID. But children, we all know now, it, it's one of the good news stories of COVID, if you want to think of a good news story, is that children simply do not get severe disease from this. So they are not at risk from COVID. But they are at risk from an interrupted education and from isolation. And so, I mean, sadly, there ha has been no death in Ontario in a child because of COVID. There was one with COVID, but we have had suicides and overdoses because of lockdown depression. We have massive problems with, with mental health issues. We have huge, uh, all of every hospital, I think in Ontario Pediatric Hospital now uh, has a uh, surplus of children with eating disorders coming through with major anxiety depression so that's just the immediate one and that's not even talking about the long-term Harvard interrupt education of loss of reading and mathematical abilities so any discussion of, of the closures really has to be a total harm minimization there are th there are some businesses or areas I think where, where the lockdown is warranted because we do need to control transmission. But I think we have to be very, very careful with the school uh, situation. Schools did an excellent job uh, with infection control measures. Children um, are not sick. And, I just want to interrupt you. you. Even the teachers, yeah. I just, I just wanted Sorry. to say because I know that um, I believe there was an educator in uh, in Toronto, in the GTA, who did die uh, from COVID. Yeah. Um, and before the break, we had, uh, there was testing at, at a school and they found a lot of asymptomatic uh, um, yeah. cases. And I think the minister um, yesterday uh, on an interview said that they are going to start doing asymptomatic testing yeah. more. And, and I think that would actually be useful to get a better sense of what's going on. But part of the asymptomatic testing, if, you're going, if we're going to do that, should also be ensuring we know where the COVID was acquired. Because studies have actually shown that children, it's uh, more frequently in outside gatherings than in school. The CDC actually published a report in December uh, looking at that. And I think we all would know that in the United States, we've had a, a large amount of transmission 
is pretty much, I think we all would acknowledge, out of control. And even there, they showed that the children who had COVID were much more likely to have gotten the, the COVID outside of school at social gatherings and not within schools. So it's just a balance. It's not to say that there will never be transmission in, in schools. It's not to say that we can ignore it. Mm. We clearly have to continue the mitigation measures. But it's really important, I think, to also think of, of the impact on children. And the impact on children is not because of COVID. The impact's because of the response to COVID. Uh, and Victoria, you know, when we do talk about community outbreaks, uh, kids go to school, mm. they come home. Maybe their parent uh, works at a factory or at a grocery. Um, would this information be useful to understanding how COVID is being transmitted? Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. And, and I think the piece around the schools is very complicated. And obviously, as a parent, I have a bit of a conflict of interest there. But but the school, the, the children are one part of the puzzle. It is also a there are adults in those environments who may be at high risk uh, for COVID and COVID co complications. And everyone in that environment, as you say, also goes home. They have family, friends, community errands that they run. And so the links between these spaces that we're inhabiting, I think we can't overlook mm -hmm. in, our, our, in our initiatives. And you, we were talking about um, stigma. Both of you brought it up. Um, I know at my kid's school, there was a few cases and some of the parents were trying to figure out um, which child had COVID. Um, Dr. Fulford, could this information, when we talk about, um, it is going to give us information and we're going to have a better understanding where it is coming from, but could it be used to stigmatize businesses that are experiencing outbreak? And what is in it for the businesses to report these numbers? Well, and, and I think that's why it's important to understand why we're going to do this. Uh, two cases in 14 days, uh, would require contact tracing, knowing where the the, the people actually got the uh, the COVID, and it may have been community acquired, and it's a coincidence. So I think as long as if it's ongoing flagrant breaches of infection control uh, practices or large outbreaks with ongoing transmission, where I think it would be important to 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 uh, maybe publicize the name. But I worry a little bit. Uh, there has been a lot of naming and blaming, and and this is a terrible thing that's happened. The COVID outbreak. But the vast majority of people are are doing their best to control it. And sometimes an outbreak is bad luck. It is not because anything wrong happened. It's not because there were any breaches of control. It was just bad luck. And so I think we just have to be very gentle uh, in how we take this information. It's useful. I think it would be really uh, helpful in terms of reopening the economy, you know where, where the true high risk settings were. Uh, but I, I also think we have to be very careful that we don't use it to uh, start to, well, as I say, name and name and blame. And Victoria, how likely is it that a worker will pass on the virus to a member of the public? I don't think we know the answer to that, to be totally honest. Um, I think that, you know, I'd like to just note that this initiative to get workplaces to report, you know, certainly there are some questions about how compliant uh, workplaces will be. And as you say, how many workplaces actually will know within a reasonable amount of time if their workers do have COVID-19. But it will be done in addition to all the usual contact tracing and reporting that happens. And so in the vast majority of these reported outbreaks, I would expect that they don't get to that level of having anybody named publicly, but it will help Toronto Public Health hopefully better understand uh, transmission in these workplaces and in the community. I think one piece, um, that, that is missing is that we don't collect information on where people work systematically as part of the contact tracing process. They do ask about some particular high-risk industries, but they don't ask broadly. So we can't track at a case level in Toronto uh, what occupations or industries are at increased risk of COVID. Uh, there are other parts of the province in Peel where they are doing this and they are able to see which industries are overrepresented. And this is really valuable information in terms of targeting prevention initiatives and supporting businesses to do better in the workplace and, and to allow workers uh, to better understand the risk, their personal risk, to access compensation. So these are all very important things, but that that's the next step in my mind. Uh, 
We've made really good progress on other social determinants of health, like collecting information on race so we can look at structural racism or look at income. And I think that collecting individual level data on where people work through the contact tracing process is, should be one of the next big priorities. And that does also support one of the other things that I picked up on in the reporting of the announcement this week was Dr. Davila's mention about this growing collaboration between public health and occupational health. And that may be something that your viewers don't realize yeah. that even Why is it though important from to know that? it's important because academically, we think of occupational health as part of public health. But from a regulatory perspective, they're siloed. So we have the Ministry of uh, Labor, Training and Skills Development that oversees occupational health and safety. And we have the Ministry of Health that you know, broadly oversees public health of, of many other things, but they're separate. They're, they have different regulations, they have different enforcement structures. And so there are silos there and COVID is crossing those boundaries and those groups of people need to come together. And I think that uh, we're trying very hard to do that, but that's a big task and, and, and we need to do better. Well, speaking of crossing, um, I think we saw the effects of it when we had the lockdown and people were leaving the lockdown areas and moving to other parts of the province where there wasn't a lockdown. Um, should the Ontario government be collecting and publishing this information across the province? Dr. Fulford, I'll start with you. So which, which information? Where the outbreaks are happening. Probably if you start to get high epidemiology, then yes, it would be useful to know where it's happening. That uh, point about asking people with the contact tracing where they work is actually a very, very important point because that would also help uh, understand a lot more about transmission because as we know, we spend a very large amount of our days at work for those of us who are, well, like me, who, co who come into work every day uh, and don't have the luxury of working from home. Again, I, I think I'd be more interested in, in publishing or at least understanding the areas where there's a lot of ongoing transmission. And so knowing that it's helpful, again, not, not to point fingers, but to have a much better understanding why this is happening. And then for people, well, like occupational health, public health, to go in and actually scrutinize really well why, what's the environment in that workplace that has facilitated the transmission? Because that that's a very constructive way of intervening and of preventing the transmission in a way that's educational and positive. So if we know, for example, that it's in this particular type of design in a grocery store or a warehouse or maybe a, a, a multi-business building to understand is it the elevators is it the washrooms is it the break rooms is it that the employer is not letting people out have any breaks is that they're not enforcing mask use when they when they can't have physical distancing so if we if we know where the outbreaks are occurring and then people can go in and have uh basically analyze the situation, understand it, that's a much more constructive way, I think, of intervening and trying to prevent ongoing transmission. Toronto City Councillor Joe Cressy has said that uh, they've been asking Toronto Public Health to collect this information for 16 weeks. Is it too little, too late, Victoria? Uh, well, it's definitely late, but I think uh, it's better late than never. And I think that collecting more and better data about workplaces and about where people work is going to help us better understand this. And Dr. Fulford? I would agree with that. We can't seem to get a handle on this virus. How optimistic are you that we can return to normal? I'll just give you each 30 seconds. Uh, Victoria? Um, I'm trying to remain optimistic. It's definitely a hard time for everyone. And, you know, I'm not from a work perspective, which is, uh, you know, the context that I study. I don't think we're ever going to go back to where we were. I think that things are going to change. And, and in some cases, hopefully, we can make that a positive change in, case, in the case of making workplaces safer for, for everyone. And Dr. Fulford? It, it will be a new normal. I am optimistic that once we have uh, healthcare workers vaccinated and the vulnerable vaccinated, that removes a lot of the pressures on the hospitals and the healthcare system, which is of course why we're doing this. Uh, will we eradicate the virus? No, I, I, I don't think so, but neither do I think we need to worry about that. I think we need to worry about ensuring we've got good protection for the vulnerable. And now with uh, a focus on vaccinating that group, I'm actually very optimistic that, that uh, we'll start to see things uh, Get, get back to a new normal. I know you're both very busy and we are so grateful um, for you spending some time with us. Thank you so much for your insights. Pleasure, thank you. Thank you.
Last month, the federal government announced a major new effort to put Canada on track to meet its climate change commitments. The $15 billion plan raises the price on carbon emissions steadily over the coming decade to more than five times the current price, that by the year 2030. Jonathan Wilkinson is Canada's Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. He's also the Liberal MP for North Vancouver, which is where we find him tonight. Minister, Happy New Year to you, and I uh, hope you and your family are reasonably okay in the midst of this pandemic. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought we'd just, since you made this announcement a while ago, just take 30 seconds off the top here to remind people of the highlights of it. So I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic here. Here is the Liberals' new climate change plan. The price on carbon to rise to $170 a ton by the year 2030. It's currently at $30 a ton. It'll climb to $50 in the year 2022. The aim, of course, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by almost a third by 2030, and that's based on a floor of Canada's emissions in the year 2005. The government hopes we can become a net zero emissions country by the year 2050. The plan includes quarterly rebates to households to try to offset the tax. For example, they say this year a family of four in the province of Ontario would see a rebate of $600. The plan also provides funding to industry, $3 billion, municipalities, $1.5 billion, remote communities, $300 million, all to help reduce emissions. There's nearly a billion dollars in the plan to improve Canada's electrical grid. Add it all up and it comes to $15 billion. And I guess, Minister, let's start with this. If we do this, how much will we actually contribute to scaling back the harmful effects of climate change globally? Well, we will make a significant contribution. I mean, the way that, that the Paris Agreement works is uh, countries around the world are signing up to, uh, to take action to fight climate change. And, and as you will know, in, in the context of any kind of international agreement, um, countries need to do what they say they're going to do if they, if they expect that others are going to do likewise. And so Canada, by taking action, is, uh, is meeting the challenge uh, alongside its international partners. It will make a meaningful contribution. I mean, there are some conservative politicians in particular who often say, well, Canada is only 2% of global emissions. Well, Canada is in the top 10 of global emitters, and we are number two in terms of per capita emissions. Countries like Canada don't take action. Um, we will not address and solve this, uh, the existential threat that is climate change. But I would also say that this is an enormous economic opportunity. And part of taking action on climate change is about seizing the, the opportunities that exist uh, that, that are being pursued by Europe, by China, and now uh, with President-elect Biden by the United States. I should ask you, however, whether this country has ever met a climate change target that it has set, not just your government, but governments going back in the past. Well, I, I think it's a, that's a good question, uh, and I think part of the, the challenge in the past has been governments have set targets without explicit and clearly defined plans for achieving them. I mean, you will recall uh, the, the, the government of Stephen Harper, which was set, a, set a target but never had a plan. Um, this government came to power in 2015. It developed the first real climate plan that Canada's ever had. It was called the Pan-Canadian Framework. It identified a significant amount of the reductions that we need, but it didn't, it didn't identify everything we needed to achieve our target. This enhanced climate plan goes beyond that. It builds on the initial work that was done by Minister McKenna. Um, it builds upon that and it provides a very, very detailed pathway through which Canada will not only meet, but we will exceed our 2030 targets. So that's why we should believe that this time it's really going to happen. It's on the table. I mean, people, people can go on the internet and look at the plan. They can look at every element of that plan. Every element has a number of uh, emissions reductions associated with it. It is a very detailed and, and, to be honest, very conservative plan at this stage. We certainly want to do more. I think your initial graphic said 32%. That is the baseline, the bare minimum. We think we can do better. We certainly think that provinces and territories in this country have an obligation to work on this issue too, and we will be engaging them in that conversation. I should get your reaction to this because I was uh, sort of snooping around on Black Locks Reporter, which is a, you know, a very fine journalistic website that uh, does a lot of shoe leather reporting. And they have got a report that they reported on from your own environment department that suggests that this plan, combined with your clean fuel standard plan, and here's the quote, will disproportionately affect low-income and middle-income households, fixed-income seniors, and single moms. You want to respond to that? 
Well, sure, I'd be happy to respond to that. I mean, first of all, uh, they're, they're mixing a whole bunch of different things. In, in the context of the price on pollution, uh, what people tend to call a carbon tax, although I would argue it's not a tax because the money is all returned, it is the price on pollution. Um, the money is all returned. And, and if you look at any independent study, including the Parliamentary Budget Office study, the, the majority of Canadian families get more money back than they pay. And it actually works in, in reverse uh, to what Blacklock is saying, where the most vulnerable Canadian families are actually receiving more money than they pay. So that part of, of the reporting that they've, uh, they've put in there is simply not true. Um, with respect to the clean fuel standard, that, there, uh, that is a, a, a regulatory mechanism that's about reducing the carbon intensity of the fuels that we, we use. Um, that's about ensuring that, that the gasoline we put in our car, the diesel uh, that, that is used in heavy duty trucks, is reducing the amount of carbon uh, emissions that it's putting out into the atmosphere. And certainly as we move forward with that, it's going to have a number of different impacts. Certainly some of the positive uh, economic impacts are it's going to drive demand for things like biofuels and hydrogen and renewable natural gas and position Canada much more strongly to be a, a positive competitor in the world. Um, certainly there are some additional costs associated with, uh, with moving to reduce the amount of carbon in those fuels. And that's exactly why we put money into doing things like helping people to retrofit their homes, to be able to make them more energy efficient, to actually save them money in the long run. You won't be surprised to hear Premier Doug Ford of Ontario is not a huge fan. We're going to pay a little clip of what he had to say about this and then come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. I, I just can't understand uh, for the life of me why anyone would want to put a burden on the backs of the hard-working people of this province. Folks, this carbon tax is going to be the worst thing you could ever see. You're paying 30% more for everything, not just, not just gas, food, cosmetics, services, restaurants. You want to see restaurants hurt? You want to see small businesses hurt? You slap 30% tax on them. And make no mistake about this, this is nothing but a 30% tax grab. I've never, ever, ever been more disappointed in an announcement ever you know, since I've been in politics. This I just cannot understand for the life of me. You want to take that on? Sure, I'd be very happy to take that on. Um, I, I would say I'm a very practical person and I believe in dealing in, in facts and evidence. Um, and I would just uh, offer that, that Premier Ford needs to go back and actually look at facts and the evidence. What he said in, in that clip is just simply not true. Um, at the end of the day, the vast majority of Canadians get more money back than they pay on the price on pollution. Um, it is an incentive to drive emissions reductions. It's the most efficient way to do that. I mean, you ask 99 or 100 economists, 99 of them will tell you that it's the most efficient way to actually drive emissions reductions. At the end of the day, Canadians and Ontarians expect their governments to take action on climate change. They expect that because it is a threat to the future of our children. They expect it because from an economic perspective, if we do not participate in the emerging low carbon economy, we are going to get left behind. We cannot put our, our heads in the sand. And, and certainly what I would say to, to Premier Ford is, you know, either he is deliberately misleading Ontarians as to how this works, or he just doesn't understand it. And I'm more than happy to sit with him and his ministers to, uh, to explain it to them. But at the end of the day, you know, politicians have an obligation to the, to the public to, uh, to, to tell them the straight, the straight goods. And if they have a disagreement, that's fine. But let's be serious and let's be real about the facts. Well, one of the other criticisms he said was that this will make us less competitive in a post-COVID world than we need to be. What's your take on that? Well, the world, the world is moving to a low carbon future. And, and uh, you, you look around the world, Europe is moving, China is moving. Look at uh, President-elect Biden and the, and the very aggressive plans he has to move, not just in terms of addressing the environmental threat, but to seizing the economic opportunity. And beyond governments, I mean, all of the major financial institutions in the world are now looking at climate as one of the major factors in making investment decisions. So we either are going to be part of moving forward to ensure that we're building an economy that is going to thrive and create prosperous uh, prosperity and jobs in the future, or we're going to stick our heads in the sand and we're going to get left behind and increasingly we're going to be more impoverished. I choose to move forward and this plan is about moving forward. Do you think the Premier is sticking his head in the sand on this one? Well, I, I think that we would like to see a lot more action at the provincial level from some, some governments. We were very disappointed when Premier Ford decided to scrap 
the cap and trade system in in uh, in Ontario when he came to power. I think we've been very disappointed in terms of, of the level of ambition with respect to climate action. Um, climate change is, is, a, is a problem for all of us, whether we are federal governments, provincial governments, or territorial governments, and we need to be working together to address that. And I certainly hope that we can find a pathway to ensure that Premier Ford is working with us to address this critical economic and environmental issue. Well, at the moment, he's not, because he's also part of the four provinces that are challenging this in the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, ha have you had a chance to sit down with anybody in his government and explain that, you know, you've lost at a lower level, you're probably going to lose at the Supreme Court as well, why not drop this and let's work together on it? Have you had that conversation? Well, certainly I've had conversations with all of my provincial and territorial counterparts about working together on climate. And, and in the early months of this year, we will be engaging a, a consultation process with all of them again with respect to how do we move forward. I mean, as, I, as we said, when we released this climate plan, it is really focused on federal actions to address climate change. But provincial governments have tools too, and we expect that they will want to and should want to uh, be part of addressing this issue. So there will be ongoing consultations, but as I say, um, you know, our view with respect to the price on pollution is it is an integral part of addressing this in a manner that's affordable. It, it will drive innovation and economic opportunity, and that's exactly what Canadians expect their governments to do, is to be thoughtful about how we move forward. Minister, I do want to ask you as well about one of the biggest purchases that any government has ever made, might be the biggest, uh, the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline, which the Fed spent $4.5 billion on. Does this climate plan of yours now make that a stranded asset? No, it doesn't make it a stranded asset. I mean, you know, I think people have to be clear. Uh, you know, I, before I got into politics, I spent almost 20 years as executive in the clean technology space, um, running companies that actually were focused on reducing carbon emissions. So I've been around around the space a long time. Um, and, and I think that, that some, some are of the view that you can turn a switch and, and everything changes overnight. That, you know, all of a sudden we go from, uh, from generating energy in traditional ways to all renewables or, or all electric cars overnight. That's just not the way it works. Um, we need to accelerate the rate of, of deployment of various new technologies. We need to be moving down a pathway that is a transition to a low carbon future. But if you think about oil and gas, um, certainly with respect to gasoline, you know, 98 or, or so percent of the cars that are on the road use gasoline right now. That will transition over time. But over the course of the coming decades, there's still going to be demand for, uh, for, uh, for oil and gas as we move towards that lower carbon future. And the Trans Mountain Pipeline is about ensuring that during that period of transition, Canada captures value for its resources, um, doesn't get the discount that it does in the United States. And so I, I don't think it's a stranded asset, but it's certainly a transitional um, tool and a transitional asset. I appreciate that politics is the art of the possible. So I understand why you just said what you just said, but I wonder whether the pre-politics Jonathan Wilkinson could believe that the politician Jonathan Wilkinson is actually saying what he just said. Oh, I think so. I mean, I'm a I'm a pretty pragmatic person. Um, I, 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 uh, I am firmly of the view that we need to achieve a net zero future by 2050. And we need to be working to ensure that our partners around the world are doing that. But we need to be thoughtful about how we get there. We need to ensure that we're doing it in a manner that will sustain the prosperity that Canadians have and that they expect that they can pass to their children. And so uh, being thoughtful means that we actually ensure that we are extracting value from existing resources as we transition to a future where we will need to develop new ways of, of, uh, of uh, generating value. It may be that, for example, in the future, that it's not uh, oil and gas uh, in their in their existing state that uh, that is a key driver of value from a natural resource perspective, but hydrogen. Um, and that will be a long-term transition. So um, I, I would have said exactly the same thing when I was running clean tech companies. It, it needs to be a thoughtful approach to transition um, that is really focused as much on the, the economic side of the equation as it is on the environmental. Let's talk about uh, the reaction that I, I'm sure you read in the National Post that John Iveson wrote after your plan came out in which he said, and I quote, the costs of climate action fall disproportionately on rural and Western Canadians, many of whom feel their jobs, their economy, and their way of life are under assault. What's your response to that? 
Well, I, I think that it is incumbent on federal governments, irrespective of, uh, of where their seats lie, to be thoughtful and sensitive about the legitimate aspirations of all regions of this country. I, uh, I grew up in Saskatchewan. Um, I, uh, I went to high school and uh, university in Saskatchewan. After graduate school, I went back and worked for the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, as an inter intergovernmental affairs specialist. So I, I've sat on the side of the table of the prairies in the discussions that happen with the federal government. Um, and, and so I do think that we need to be thoughtful about that. But I, I would take issue with some of the things that Minister, Mr. Iveson, uh, Iveson says. I do think that there is a future here um, for all regions of the country. And certainly in the context of the prairies, it's about things like hydrogen. It's about things like biofuels. It's about geothermal. There's a whole range of opportunities um, that exist for the for the prairies that, uh, that, to be honest, thoughtful people in Saskatchewan and Alberta are, are looking at and seizing. I mean, if, if you go and you look at organizations like Capital Power in Alberta or, or Transalta or, or Suncor, I mean, they all understand that we need to transition to this low carbon and ultimately net zero future. And they're building business plans on that basis, business plans that are going to employ thousands of, of Alberta workers. And that's, that's the kind of partnerships that we're looking to develop. I appreciate your position on that. And of course, sometimes in politics, it's not the message, it's the messenger. And while the message you may think is fine, does the Liberal Party, as currently constituted, have any credibility on the prairies in order to make that case? Well, look, I mean, it, it's, it's clear that we don't hold seats on, in, in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, we do in Manitoba, which is part of the prairies. Um, but I would say that, uh, that clearly there is a lot of concern in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and it is incumbent on us as a government, we represent all Canadians, not simply those Canadians that voted for us, um, to be listening and to be looking to respond. And, and I have had very productive conversations with my counterparts in Alberta and in Saskatchewan. I intend to continue those conversations. At the end of the day, we want to help to develop a future that, uh, that is going to ensure prosperity for the folks that live there and that want to hand that down to their kids. Um, I, I certainly understand that, that, uh, that there is concern. I would tell you that it's, it's not surprising that there is lots of concerns about the future, um, given this whole discussion around the nexus between energy and the environment. But there are pathways. And, and uh, you know, certainly one of the objectives that I have in the job that I currently have is to be finding pathways to reach out and have more productive conversations on the prairies. You've mentioned Joe Biden's name a couple of times already, and I want to ask you about rumors that we're hearing coming out of the United States about what his administration might do. And one of the things we hear he might do is actually ban the sale of cars that burn fuel at a date certain sometime down the road. If they did that, Canada would have to go alongside, right? Well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I do think that there are lots of opportunities to uh, to talk with the Biden administration about a North American approach to transportation. I, I think that's what um, Canadian businesses, industry, and in, in the sector would be looking for. I think that's what workers who uh, who uh, gain, you know gain their their employment in the sector would be looking for. And there are a whole range of ways we can do that. Certainly, one of the things that we're looking for early on is to work with them on uh, on light duty uh, fuel efficiency standards. We had an agreement with President Obama. Um, some of those gains uh, on the climate side were rolled back by the uh, by the Trump administration. I think there's a lot more that we can do in terms of enhancing energy efficiency of, uh, of light duty vehicles. Certainly the deployment of zero emission vehicles, be they electric or hydrogen, or, is something that we want to, to look at. And, and uh, certainly working with the United States, whether that's through some kind of supply mandate or, or other mechanisms, um, we're open to that conversation. But we want to do it in a way that's actually going to be healthy for the sector. And part of being healthy for the sector really means that we'd like to do that on a North American wide basis. And Joe Biden's election really opens up that opportunity. Okay. Minister, in our last minute here, I just want to, uh, we talk mostly policy, but a, a little bit of politics on this program. So I want to finish up with a political question. You know, I, I think many of us who follow politics remember well back in 2007 when Stéphane Dion, who was then the leader of your party, brought forward something called the Green Shift, which in hindsight, a lot of people had a lot of praise for. But at the time, uh, was a little ahead of its time, and you guys had, at that time, your worst result in electoral history. Subsequently, not the worst of all time, but the worst at that time. I wonder how concerned you are in a minority parliament going to the polls at some point, probably, in the next whatever, spring, fall, whatever. I wonder if you're worried that all of this work that you're doing right now can be actually 
quite easily demonized and affect you guys politically? Well, I, I would actually say no, um, because I actually I, I would say that the Canadian public has has really moved a long way, and uh, since two thousand seven, in terms of both the the acknowledgement that climate change is is a real and present threat to our way of life, um, and certainly to the way of life that we would hope to see for our children and for our grandchildren. But also, increasingly Canadians, and you will see this in public opinion polls, are of the view that taking action on climate change can be good for the economy. In the past, I think there were lots of questions about that that Canadians had. Increasingly, what they're seeing is, is the same thing that I'm seeing, is around the world, people are saying, hey, there's an enormous economic opportunity here. We need to be part of seizing that opportunity that's going to help us build an economy that's going to be strong, that's going to create good jobs, um, and that's going to allow us to fight the existential threat of climate change. I think that, uh, that at the end of the day, what you saw in the last election was, you know, two-thirds of Canadians voted for political parties who had credible climate plans. Um, climate was one of the only real substantive issues that was debated in the last campaign. I expect that it will be one of the major issues that will be debated. I think ideally, we, we, we would love to get to a place where all political parties in this country had a, a serious and a credible approach to climate in the same way that, for example, in the United Kingdom, they do. A conservative government is very aggressive on, on climate. Um, we're not there yet. I, I would love to see a credible plan come forward from from uh, from Mr. O'Toole. I, I, I hazard that that's probably unlikely, but I would cer certainly love to see a credible plan to address the climate crisis come forward. And I'm certainly very happy to engage that conversation in the context of an election. That's Jonathan Wilkinson. He is the Minister for Environment and Climate Change for the Government of Canada, coming to us from Vancouver. Minister, as I say, Happy New Year. Appreciate you joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Putting on a mask to go out in the world is standard practice now, but it's unlikely you've seen any quite like those inspired by a simple question posed by Métis artist from Newmarket, which became a call to beadwork artists around the world. Joining us now to explain from Ottawa is Shelby Lisk, our Ontario Hubs journalist covering Indigenous issues. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Dan. So Shelby, let's get right into it. Uh, what was the question that sparked the Breathe project? So right at the beginning of COVID in the spring, we saw lots of people making all kinds of homemade masks. Um, and Natalie Burton, a Métis artist, she took to social media with the question, why haven't I seen any beaded masks? So as a Métis artist, you know, she talked to me about how in her culture, they bead everything, and, and she wasn't seeing that from the Métis artists at the time. So this connected her with another Métis artist, Lisa Shepard, and together they started Breathe as a call out to beadwork artists to submit masks that are beaded in the traditional style of their nation or community. Now, this sounds like an obvious question. We're talking about masks, but why was the project called Breathe? Yeah, so I asked her that question and I thought it was kind of a silly question, but she, yeah, I mean, for the obvious reasons, you know, we we need to breathe, these, we have to wear these masks now, but also because, you know, she described the situation that we're in right now as, you know, we all kind of don't know what's going to happen. We're all holding our breath um, and this is giving artists a space to process everything that's going on and kind of like relax, let go and and breathe. <laughs> now, like you had mentioned, this was a call out that started here in Canada, but has since gone international. Tell us about that. Yeah, so they started the, the call out as a Facebook page, um, which went live in April and they asked artists to upload um, pictures of their masks. Um, and within the first two weeks, Natalie said they had over a thousand members, which they were not expecting um, from all over the world. And then within a few weeks of that, they started seeing masks coming in. Um, and now their page has about two, over 2,000 followers. They've had 300 different people submit masks, and it's they've been coming in from all over the world. So Canada and the U.S., but also they've had submissions from New Zealand, Australia, and Portugal, just to name a few. Now, I had a chance to go on the Facebook page, and I scroll through there, but is there an opportunity for people to see these masks in real life at all? Yes, yeah, so they did do two special call-outs that were specifically for an art exhibition. So right now they have an exhibition on view um, in Alberta at the White Museum in Banff, and it's going to be a traveling exhibition. So it is going to travel across the country, and it will be coming to Ontario in 2021. So you can watch out for the information about that. Now, 
What made you want to photograph these masks? On our website, we'll have, uh, we have 12 uh, masks on our website of 46, but what made you want to photograph them in the first place? Yeah, I saw I saw this when when these artists first started it, and I thought it was such a cool project. But I saw all kinds of media covering it, and so I wasn't really sure how I wanted to cover it, but in a different way, in a, in a TVO um, hubs way. And so when I saw that my community in Tyndanaga was doing their own challenge inspired by this, I thought that was perfect. Um, you know, this little this little challenge as a part of this big international story, and so. Um, I, I contacted them and they were really excited about it. And it was also something that was very manageable for me during COVID to be able to get to my community, you know, with all the restrictions and, um, you know, stay with my family while I was in the area. So there was also some practical um, restrictions around what I could do and um, doing it in my community really made it a lot easier. All right, so let's look at some. Um, the first one that we have looks sort of like a wedding mask. What can you tell us about this one? This is Carol Ann, um, and she comes from a family of beaters and leather workers and sewers in our community. So she's been beading since she was a little girl um, with her grandma and her mother. She told me that she, she's been beading for over 50 years now. Um, so this mask was inspired by she was supposed to get married in the fall um, of 2020, but as the provincial guidelines started coming out and they, and they realized with the restrictions that they, their wedding was not going to be possible, um, so they had to postpone it. And when this challenge came about, she knew that she wanted to make a wedding mask to commemorate that. Um, she said that she has made wedding dresses, wedding moccasins, wedding jewelry for people before, but she had never made a wedding mask. Um, so there's a ton of intricate details in the mask, um, down all the way to, you know, there's the tassels that are hanging down on the side. And she talked to me about those you know, sort of looking reminiscent of what a bride might wear uh, for earrings on her wedding day. Uh, I'm curious, you know, her wedding has been postponed. Does she plan to wear this mask on her wedding day? <laughs> I asked her that question as well, and she said uh, she hopes not, <laughs> because COVID should be over, hopefully, by the time they're getting married. Fair enough. Uh, let's bring up the second mask. Now, this one is a little more simpler than the first one. What can you tell us about this? I understand it's a tribute to someone. Yes, so the artist Tammy, she created this mask as a tribute to her father who passed away in April. And so because of the COVID restrictions that were going on, uh, her and her family weren't able to visit her father to say goodbye, um, to see him in his last moments or to have a funeral or anything like that to, to really start that grieving process. And so she created this mask as a way to remember him, but also as a way to you know work through some of that grief. Um, and her father was a musician. So you can see a tiny little music note in there amongst the flowers. And she also said that he always loved uh, the floral beadwork so she made that specifically for him all right so the third one actually has the image of a hummingbird is there a story there yeah, so Callie, um, she beaded the hummingbird on hers also in, in memory of her late mother, who um, the hummingbird was her favorite bird. And then also, you know, making the mask in memory of her grandmother, who was a beater. And this mask is done entirely in, ra in a raised beadwork style, which is signature to Haudenosaunee beadwork. Um, it's not something that I've seen any other nations do. Um, so if you see any contemporary or antique pieces of beadwork that have this raised style, is probably Haudenosaunee or Iroquois uh, beadwork. Now, I want to look at this fourth one. Now, this, I will admit, is probably my favorite one. Uh, it is a constellation mask. What is its significance? The mask um, here, it shows the story or the legend of the Big Dipper constellation. So there are many versions of this story. Um, and the one that I know um, in this sort of simplified version is that the stars that kind of uh, trail behind are um, symbolize these hunters and then the little cluster of stars symbolizes the bear and so the story is that these three hunters are chasing the bear and throughout the throughout the seasons the constellation changes in the sky so in the spring and summer um, the constellation looks like how we see it here um, with the hunters chasing the bear and then in the fall it tips um, so the bear would be um, underneath and in our in our legend we say that 
that is when the hunters catch up with the bear. Um, They're able to hunt him. And it is the bear's blood coming down from the sky that actually changes all the leaves uh, color in the fall. And then in the winter, you know, it keeps rotating and the bear is sort of upside down uh, sleeping um, until it comes to spring again when the hunters start their chase. <laughs> Now, if that's not an amazing story in itself, uh, that's, that's remarkable. But I understand there's also a, a really cool feature with this mask as well. Yes, uh, the beads actually all glow in the dark, which was really cool to see, but very hard to photograph. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, the last mask that we're going to show is, uh, is quite special and also includes you in there in that photo. Uh, tell us about this turtle mask. Yeah, so this is my mama. Um, she <laughs> is a very talented uh, sewer, um, quilter, you know, basically everything she can do with her hands. Um, but she never did beadwork uh, growing up. So that's something that she's been doing to reconnect to our culture and to our community. And so the mask that she's wearing has the turtle on it. Um, and she beaded that because our family is Turtle Clan. Um, and then she also beaded the mask that I'm wearing there in the photo with her. And so that's a symbol that uh, some people might recognize. It's the Hiawatha belts, which symbolizes the five nations coming together to form the Iroquois Confederacy. So that's sort of the symbolism um, on there. But it was really nice to be able to go back home. And I didn't know my mom was actually going to be a part of this challenge when I proposed this story. But um, it was really nice to have her be a subject and uh, to be able to be with my family for this story. Well, again, Shelby, again, another great story. I want to thank you so much. Uh, you can see the rest of the photo gallery on our website at tvo.org. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jan. That is the agenda for Friday, January 8th, 2021. And next week, we'll examine the toll of the delayed and canceled medical care in this COVID era, scan the year ahead in foreign affairs, and as pro hockey gets back on the ice, talk to legendary coach and commentator, Brian Burke. I'm Jan Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve, we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.